Hello everyone, and thank you for joining the third week of the Signal Center's Accessibility Awareness Series. Signal Centers is located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a gig city on the Tennessee River and ranked as one of 2019's top 100 places to live in America. Signal Centers provides technology, accommodations, and training to help individuals with disabilities live their best lives. Here is CEO Donna McConico. Hi, I'm Donna McConico. Welcome to the Signal Center's Accessibility Awareness Summit. Last year at our very first summit, our keynote speaker, Haben Gurma, said this, the problem is never the disability. She was right. We are living in the midst of a technology renaissance and we must be the leaders insisting that this movement is for all. Accessibility is within our reach and it will take persistence and creativity to fully embrace all of the possibilities that technology offers for individuals with disabilities. Thank you for joining us again this year to continue the conversation about accessibility. This webinar series would not be possible without the support of our partner and host, Chattanooga State Community College. With an enrollment of more than 8,000 students, Chattanooga State offers more than 100 degree plans. Its digital accessibility mission statement is a commitment to provide all individuals the opportunity to use technologies. Here is Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Beth Norton. Chattanooga State hopes this conference series will inspire transformative conversations about the inclusion of all individuals in the ever-changing world of digital technology. Signal Centers is grateful to the following sponsors. Unum, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, Phil Hour, Electric Power Board, Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities, AT&T, and a special thank you to McKee Foods for sponsoring today's sessions. It started a long, long time ago. Little Debbie's granddad woke up and said, You know, I think I'll make the world a treat. A fresh from the oven, something sweet. The face of Little Debbie will go with each one. As my granddaughter's the vision of freshness and fun. And through the years and generations, we've served up smiles and innovations. Oatmeal cream pies. Swiss rolls galore, zebra cakes, Nutty Buddy, Honey Bun, and more. We make them and whoosh, they rush to your store for the smiles they bring you and the difference that makes. That's the reason this family bakery does what it takes. And each morning when we awake, we look in the mirror. Today, we bake. And now, in recognition of Global Accessibility Awareness Day, accessible media platforms and entertainment with Ben Jacobs, an expert in smart home technology, accessible mainstream gaming, and assistive technology solutions. Hey Ben, how are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Feel free to take it away whenever you'd like. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, thanks for the wonderful in introduction and thank you uh, Signal Centers for having me as well as McKee and all of the other sponsors of this, uh, of this uh, event. Uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to come here and share all of this great information with you guys and hopefully uh, everyone will come away with this having learned about some new solutions uh, when it comes to accessible media. Uh, like I said before, my name is Ben Jacobs. Uh, I own the company Rebel Tech Consulting uh, and I wanted to start off by mentioning that I have no relevant uh, financial relationships or relevant non-financial relationships to disclose. No one's paying me to uh, sell their products. So anything I talk about here today uh, is all my own opinion on uh, what is a great solution for people with disabilities. So uh, I'm going to briefly cover the agenda here. Uh, we have a whole bunch 
to go over today. Uh, it's going to be kind of like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, we'll be going through pretty quickly a lot of these different solutions, um, but I want to make sure that you guys have uh, as much information as possible. We've got this little bit of time today. I want to be able to uh, cover questions at the end of all of this as well. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get through this and uh, have plenty of time for any questions that people have at the end. So I'll start off with a brief introduction about myself in Rebel Tech. We'll move on to some smart home solutions uh, so that people will be able to stay uh, uh, connected, socially connected to uh, what's going on in the world today, as well as uh, being able to connect with uh, their friends and family. Uh, we'll talk about built-in console accessibility. So we'll be talking about video game platforms and the different accessibility solutions that are built into those. Uh, right now, video game platforms are much more than just uh, video games. You can have access to different apps like Twitter and Facebook, uh, Internet Explorers as well. Uh, so it's really a great way of staying socially connected. Uh, and having those accessible features is really important. We'll talk about some third-party console accessibility solutions, so things that aren't necessarily built into the platform, but can be added to the platform so that people will be able to access exactly what they need. Uh, we'll also talk about PC accessibility solutions, uh, mobile accessibility solutions, so solutions for your phone, whether that's on iOS or Android. Uh, we'll also talk about tabletop accessibility solutions. So when I talk about uh, gaming and staying socially connected, we're not just talking about on video games or on your phone or PC, but also sitting down around a family card table and playing games with your friends and family that way. We'll also cover a few different uh, other resources that you can look at after uh, all of this is done uh, and you can go and find out more information from these different resources. And then, like I said before, we'll wrap up with a Q&A session. So, um, yeah, moving into our introduction. Uh, so who I am, uh, again, my name is Ben Jacobs. I'm originally from Maine. Uh, here's a picture of myself with my wife, Liz Persaud, who actually spoke last week. Uh, many of you might have been there on uh, for her presentation as well. Uh, but this picture is of us on top of Cadillac Mountain in Arcadia National Park in Maine. Uh, I still try to go up there uh, once a year. Uh, to visit with family and just enjoy being there. I really recommend uh, anyone who hasn't already, uh, make sure you get a chance to visit Maine. There's really no place else like it. Uh, after growing up in Maine, uh, I wound up joining the Air Force. Uh, I joined the Air Force as a tech controller. Uh, the nickname for tech controllers is water walkers because we deal with so many different technologies, have to know so much about each and every one of them and how they operate and how they work is kind of like we had to walk on water. Um, so I used a whole bunch of different technologies uh, and used them together to accomplish something that was greater than any of those technologies could have accomplished on their own. Um, so I took that expertise and once I retired from the Air Force and moved to Georgia, um, I joined Georgia Tech and their assistive technology program, Tools for Life. Uh, there, uh, they saw my expertise when it came to cutting edge and emerging technologies and figuring out how they could be leveraged by people with uh, disabilities so that they could be more independent, whether at home, at work, at school, or at play. Um, a couple of different areas that I really focused on were smart home technologies, as well as um, video game accessibility. Uh, once I, uh, I had been working at Georgia Tech for quite a while with Tools for Life, and I had a wonderful demonstration lab that they still have there now, um, where people could come in and see uh, the different smart uh, smart home technologies that were available to them. And every time I demonstrated that to people, their minds were really blown and they were really excited about all of the technologies that were available for them. But there was always the question of, well, 
who's going to install this for us? Who's gonna come out to our home and install this for us? And unfortunately, while I was at Georgia Tech and at Tools for Life, that wasn't really something that was within our scope of service. Uh, I wasn't able to go out and do that. And then I also wasn't really able to come up with a recommendation for uh, someone beyond uh, your resident uh, neighborhood geek, get them to come out and, and help you set this stuff up. So um, I wound up leaving Georgia Tech and creating Rebel Tech Consulting uh, so that I could provide services for individuals that included not only consultation and, you know, being able to recommend different devices for them and demonstrate them, but to also go out and install uh, the technologies in their homes, set that technology up so that it worked for them, customizing it so that uh, it really became natural to be able to use these technologies, and then providing continued support to those individuals. So if any uh, they wound up having any problems with any of the equipment, I would be able to come out and help them out with that. Uh, also part of Rebel Tech Consulting, I provide services for organizations that serve people with disabilities. So I provide trainings, I provide presentations, much like this one, and I provide those organizations with access to expertise. Uh, so if any organization has any questions about any of the upcoming or cutting edge technologies that are coming out that they should be aware of, um, you know, they can reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to help. So, uh, moving on to smart home solutions, uh, smart speakers. Smart speakers are uh, voice controlled. They're uh, these uh, little devices that you see here in the lower right corner of the screen. Uh, first, we have the Amazon Echo. Uh, we have the Google Home, and then we have the uh, Apple HomePod. Uh, so these devices are voice controlled. They're always listening for you to give a command. You say the hot word and you can, uh, you can access whatever information you need. Uh, you can control uh, devices throughout your home using these, um, but you can also ask simple questions like, what's the weather going to be? Tell me about the news, uh, all of these different things that you can do. Um, you can listen to the radio on these devices. You can also actually make phone calls on these devices completely for free. Um, that's one feature that a lot of people are not aware of. Uh, so you would connect uh, your contacts to your uh, smart speaker, and then it could be as simple as saying, call mom, and uh, you, you're instantly connected. Uh, it rings up your mom's phone, and uh, you can have that conversation through the speaker. Uh, there's also smart displays that are available. Uh, Google Home has uh, the Google Hub or the Google Nest Hub, uh, and then Amazon has the Echo Show. Uh, so these are very similar to smart speakers, with the exception of the fact that all of the information isn't only presented audibly. Of course, there are people out there that have disabilities that um, prevent them from being able to understand uh, information that's communicated audibly only. Of course, there's people that are deaf or hard of hearing uh, that, you know, wouldn't necessarily benefit from a speaker telling them information. That's where smart displays come in. Uh, so it, it gives you the information audibly, but it also shows the information on a small screen as well. Um, so a lot of things, there are some things that a uh, smart display would be beneficial for everyone, including uh, if you were to ask um, the Echo for a recipe, it would tell you the recipe audibly, but then once it was done and you were on the next step, you would have to ask for the recipe again. With a smart display, the recipe is displayed on the screen there and you're able to scroll up and down and be able to check back in on it anytime you want. So each of these smart speakers have a built-in digital assistant. Uh, the Google Home has the Google Assistant. Uh, the Amazon Echo has Alexa. And the Apple HomePod has Siri. Um, so uh, these smart speakers, like I said, there's so many different things that you can do with them. Right now, uh, with the state of the, the world that we're in in the middle, 
middle of a pandemic right now, it's of course very important that people stay socially connected and up to date on the news and what's going on in the world. Uh, and these smart speakers are a great way to be able to do that. Uh, like I said, you can ask for the news, you can call your family and friends, and uh, it's just really great affordable way to be able to stay connected accessibly just using your voice. Uh, so here on this slide, I have a video that I would like to share with you. Unfortunately, because of some of the uh, technic technical uh, things with the platform we're presenting on today, it's going to be a bit difficult for me to do that. However, uh, this uh, PowerPoint will be available to everyone after this presentation is over, um, and you'll be able to go back in here and actually uh, watch this video. Um, it's actually a, a video that I um, shot and directed and wrote and everything myself, um, but I interviewed uh, a couple of different people with disabilities that utilize uh, smart home technology and uh, the different changes that it's made in their life, what it's allowed them to uh, be able to do independently. Um, so my wife, Liz Persaud, is one of the people that talks about our own home and how we have these different technologies set up all through our house and all of the great things that she's able to do independently now as well. And we also um, interviewed one of our student workers at the time, uh, Trey Quinn, uh, and uh, again, how he's able to use uh, these smart technologies to be able to access his own home, to be able to come and go as he pleases, to be able to call an Uber driver, uh, to be able to call his dad, all of these great things. So it's a seven minute video on YouTube. Um, if you get a chance to check that out after the presentation today, um, I think you'll really enjoy it. Oh. Okay, moving on to uh, smart home audiovisual equipment. Uh, so this is equipment that will allow you to control your TV, to control your sound system, and to control your cable box. Um, these also tend to give you access to apps on your TV. Uh, so things like YouTube, Hulu, Netflix, and all of the other different entertainment apps that are available to you. Um, so a couple of different solutions that are available include uh, setting up a Google Home, one of those smart speakers I talked about earlier, with a device called a Chromecast. Uh, Chromecast is a small dongle that you uh, hook up into the back of your TV, and it allows you to make your dumb TV smart. Uh, you can stream any content from your Android device up onto your TV, and again, you'll have access to things like YouTube, Hulu, Netflix. You'd be able to say um, the hot word for the smart speaker. I don't want to say it because I have smart speakers right here in the room I'm in. Um, but you'd be able to say, Google, uh, show me uh, videos of puppies playing in the rain and it would automatically load up YouTube on your TV and search for puppies playing in the rain and start playing uh, that video for you. Um, so the Chromecast and Google Home combined with the Logitech Harmony Hub. So the Logitech Harmony Hub is pictured on the right side of the screen here. It's a small black box that sends out infrared signals to all of your devices. Um, so pretty much it acts like a universal remote remote. <clears throat> uh, any remote for any of your uh, audiovisual devices is able to be controlled through the Logitech Harmony Hub, essentially. Uh, you program it with all of your different devices. You tell it what the, the model and the brand of your devices are, and it automatically gets the remote control codes and allows you to control uh, all of your devices through this one device. And again, you can pair that up with a smart speaker um, and you can then say, turn on the TV and it'll turn on your TV, it'll turn on your cable box, it'll turn on your sound system um, and you'll be good to go. Um, you can also change channels with it. You can say, uh, watch CNN or watch Fox News, um, watch the Weather Channel, watch Animal Planet, pretty much any channel you, you have that you'd want to watch, um, you're able to switch to it just using your voice. Um, and then 
So that is a great solution that uh, it, it combines several different technologies together. So you have the smart speaker, you have the Chromecast device, and then you have the Logitech Harmony Hub. However, uh, there's now uh, the Fire TV Cube that Amazon recently came out with. Uh, I believe they released the most uh, recent version of the Fire TV Cube last year. Um, and the Fire TV Cube, it combines all three of those devices into one little box. It's really cool. You get all the features of a smart speaker. So anything you'd ask in Amazon Echo, you could ask the Fire TV Cube. Uh, and it'll give you that same information audibly, as well as it'll put it up on your TV screen for you. Um, you also have those Chromecast uh, capabilities built into it, where you have access to all of your different smart apps, your YouTube, Hulu, Netflix, all of those other apps that you might want to use on your TV um, for entertainment or for your news. And then you also have the uh, capabilities of the Logitech Harmony Hub. So uh, this actually has an infrared controller in it, and, and you're able to control your television, you're able to control your cable box, you're able to control your sound system. So you can say mute the TV, uh, you can say switch to cable, um, switch to Fire TV, uh, watch Netflix, all of these different things. So really this is the, when it comes to controlling your audio visual equipment, this is definitely like my number one recommended uh, solution uh, as it puts all of those other devices together in one easy to use affordable um, package. So uh, moving on to video game consoles, uh, built-in console accessibility. Um, once again, I just want to mention that, uh, especially right now with the coronavirus and people having to social distance, uh, some people are in nursing homes or assisted care facilities where they're not able to, uh, I mean, they're living on their own, really. People aren't able to come in and visit. Um, you know, they're, they're just very socially isolated. Uh, they may not know what's going on with news. Um, you know, all of these different things lead to just a, a being completely isolated. And of course, that can lead to depression. It can lead to, you know, all sorts of different uh, health problems. Uh, so with the uh, Xbox One, with video game consoles, you're not only um, having access to the social uh, aspect of playing games with your friends or even the, uh, the escapism of playing games, um, but you're also able to access news, you're able to talk with friends and things like that. So again, uh, video game consoles are important for numerous reasons, especially right now um, where people are just very isolated. So um, some built-in accessibility features for the Xbox One in particular, this is Microsoft's console. Uh, they have a narrator that is available. So pretty much anything that is on screen on the operating system, you can have it read out loud for you. It's pretty much text to speech. Uh, you also have a magnifier that's built in. So at any time in the middle of a game, if you uh, want to pause the game and be able to zoom in on a specific area of the screen to make it easier to see what's going on, you can do that with the magnifier. There's also an option for high contrast. So of course, people that have low vision, um, sometimes it's easier to see things if they're in a higher contrast and there's an option available on the Xbox One's operating system to make that a possibility. Uh, closed captions and game chat transcription. These are some pretty cool things. Uh, closed captions, of course, have been around for quite a while. Uh, I understand we have a captionist with us today um, that's providing closed captions and we really appreciate that so that everyone is able to um, get all of the information that they need, um, all of the information that we're giving out today. Um, and the same thing happens with uh, video games. So um, when you're playing a game and a character is saying something, uh, it's pretty standard now that uh, closed captions or subtitles are an available um, option. On the Xbox console itself, it'll actually uh, provide closed captions for videos as well. Uh, so for any video that you're watching on YouTube or Netflix, of course, you have access to closed captions as well. 
game chat transcription is a recent uh, feature that is expected. It, right now, it's only su supported by a couple of different games on the Xbox, but uh, it's expected that they'll be rolling the feature out um, console-wide, platform-wide, so that every game will have this feature. Uh, game chat transcription is uh, a feature where if you're playing a game with your buddies, uh, you're talking on a microphone, uh, you're um, relaying information to them, and you might say, hey, we need, obje uh, we need help over at Objective B. Can you come and help us? Um, of course, if someone is deaf or hard of hearing, they're going to be missing out on that part of the game. They're going to be missing out on the camaraderie of uh, working together with a team over the voice chat. Well, with game chat transcription, it actually in real time transcribes whatever people are saying over the microphone and has it pop up on the screen in the game uh, so that um, anyone that's deaf or hard of hearing would be able to still access that information and understand, oh yeah, my teammates, they need help over there. I better get over there and help them out. Um, button mapping. Uh, so this is a really cool feature available on the controllers for the Xbox One. Uh, what it does is it allows you to take any of the buttons on the controller, any of the inputs on the controller, and remap it to any other button on the controller. So for example, in the picture here, we you can kind of see uh, the right side of a Xbox One controller there, and there are buttons that are labeled Y, X, A, and B. And they're on the right side of the controller. Unfortunately, there aren't left-handed controllers available where those buttons would be on the left side, for example. Um, so for someone that maybe they have trouble accessing those buttons on the right side, they can use button mapping to remap those buttons over to the left side of the controller and be able to access them on that side. So again, any, any input on the controller, you can even uh, switch the thumbsticks. There are two thumbsticks that are on these controllers. You'd be able to switch them uh, in the software so that the right thumbstick that acts as if it's the left thumbstick. I know it's a little abstract to understand, like speaking about it, but uh, this is something really that's uh, really beneficial for many people. There are some games that they only use a few of the different inputs, and for someone that maybe they, um, they're only able to use one of their hands, um, they would be able to remap all of those inputs to buttons that are more easily accessible for them. Another really cool uh, feature is Copilot. Uh, so what Copilot does is it allows you to take two different controllers, two separate controllers, and bind them together as if they were one controller. Uh, so, for example, if I press A on the right controller, it'll act the same as if I pressed it on the left controller and vice versa. So what this allows for are a couple of different scenarios. Um, you could have uh, multi-site control. So, for example, if someone was able to use their left hand um, and they were able to use their foot to access different controls on the controller, they could put a controller down by their foot and another one in their left hand and be able to access the different inputs on those two controllers and have it act as if it's just one single controller. Um, you could have a controller under your chin or um, under your elbow, pretty much anywhere that you would have access to those inputs. Um, you could put a controller there and uh, be able to use it as if it's a single controller. Another way Copilot comes in handy is if uh, I, I would call it maybe a guided uh, gaming session um, where, uh, you know, for example, if Liz wanted to play Super Mario Brothers and she's able to access the uh, jump button, she's able to access the run button, but she can't access uh, the movement buttons like moving left and right on the screen. Uh, she could have a controller in her hands and be able to access the, a and the, the jump button and the uh, run button, and then I could have a controller in my hands and I could control the movement buttons. And together we'd be able to play a game, uh, you know, working as a team using these two separate controllers as a single controller.
Uh, Built-in accessibility for the PlayStation 4, a lot of it is the same. Uh, so you have text-to-speech, which works pretty much the same as narrator. You have Zoom, which is uh, the same as a uh, magnifier. Uh, you have invert colors, so high contrast as well. Um, you can also go in and uh, make the text in the system uh, larger or bolded, so it might be easier to see. You have closed captions. This is the subtitles and closed captions that are available on the Xbox One. Unfortunately, they don't have the real-time uh, chat transcription yet. Uh, you have the button remapping as well. And then you're also able to use voice commands using a microphone connected to your controller. So you could say, open Uncharted 4, and it would start the game up for you. Moving on to uh, the Nintendo Switch. Um, unfortunately, while Nintendo opened up the world of gaming to many people through the addition of simple motion controlled games on the Wii, I don't know how many people remember, um, there was a controller where you were able to um, hold it and swing it around, and that was how you pretty much played games. Uh, it opened up uh, gaming to a lot of people that normally aren't comfortable with the controller. Um, however, uh, since then, accessibility options have largely been missing from their systems. Uh, so the Nintendo Switch, it has a few uh, features that you could consider accessible. Um, one of them being that it's portable. It's small. You can pick it up and take it with you. You don't necessarily have to have a TV screen. Uh, you can pull the screen right up in front of you. So if you're uh, low vision, uh, you'd be able to see the screen just by uh, bringing the screen up to your face. Um, touchscreen, uh, so touchscreen is a feature that can be considered accessible as well. Um, and then Joy-Cons, so the Joy-Cons are these small controllers um, just from their size alone and their simplicity, they're, they're pretty accessible. But as far as operating system accessibility features, there, there's really not a whole lot there when it comes to the Nintendo Switch. Moving on to some third-party console accessibility solutions. Uh, the Xbox Adaptive Controller, this is a really cool, amazing device uh, that Microsoft developed on their own over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, there are two large buttons that are um, easily accessible. They're very large and hard to miss. Um, you have uh, three and a half millimeter ports for each controller input. So. Across the top of the device that's pictured on the right hand side of the screen here, you can see all of these different little symbols across the top and behind each of those symbols is a little headphone jack that you'd be able to plug in your own switch. So you'd be able to plug in your own simple button switch or um, a grasp switch, a lever switch, pretty much any switch that you might use for accessibility you can plug in and it'll act as that input. So you can plug in switches for your A input, for your trigger, um, all sorts of different things. You have an input for every uh, button and input that's available on a controller. You also have two USB ports where you're able to plug in uh, joysticks. Um, and then you have, uh, there's ergonomic design. So there's actually three mounting uh, ports on the bottom of this controller where you'd be able to mount it uh, in front of your chair. Um, it's also a very flat uh, device. So you'd be able to put it on your lap or on a table in front of you, uh, wherever works best ergonomically for you. Uh, like I said, at first, um, they, it, they took two years developing this, uh, working with various organizations um, to make sure that this device was as accessible as possible. Uh, they actually spent another year just developing the packaging to make sure that the experience with the Xbox Adaptive Controller was accessible from the moment it arrived on your doorstep to the moment that you used it. There's no clamshell packaging. Uh, there's no uh, hard to cut pa uh, packing tape. Um, they just really made it accessible using uh, loops that you can easily put your fingers into to be able to open up the packaging, to be able to pull the controller out. Uh, and uh, on this slide, uh, right on uh, where it says here, one year development of packaging, there's actually a video that I've linked to on YouTube that goes through the various accessibility features of the packaging.
Uh, it's available now. Um, you can get uh, Xbox Adaptive Controller pretty much anywhere that sells electronics or video games. It's only $100, which is really amazing. Uh, it's a really great start. Um, really, $100 is unheard of. There was a predecessor to the Xbox Adaptive Controller that did a lot of the same sort of things, uh, and it cost uh, four or $500 which for a lot of people, that's that's a very prohibitive barrier for people to be able to access gaming. They can't necessarily spend four or $500 just to be able to play video games. So $100, while it's not the same as buying a standard controller, which is $60, um, it's really a great step in the right direction of making accessible gaming available for everyone affordably. Um, and again, here on this uh, bullet point, I have everyone can play. I have another video uh, linked showing uh, how people with disabilities are utilizing this device to be able to enjoy uh, the community of gaming. So the Xbox adaptive controller is really awesome. You're able to use your own switches. However, um, even like the cost of switches, um, they can be expensive. They can be really expensive. Um, you know, a single switch can go for upwards of $100 on its own. Um, but thankfully, Logitech has stepped in with the G Adaptive Gaming Kit. Um, so this is a gaming kit that comes with all sorts of switches, mounting options for a very affordable price. It comes with four light touch buttons. So these are... Um, these are the um, A and B buttons that you see here. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry. These are the X buttons. So this little thin uh, button that's on, uh, towards the middle of the frame here, uh, you get four of those light touch buttons in this package. You get two variable triggers. So this is the one that's labeled RT over here, and they work as uh, your left and right triggers on the controller. You get three small buttons. Uh, which are the ones that are labeled B here. Uh, three large buttons, these are the ones that are labeled A. And then uh, you get rigid and flexible hook and loop boards. So on the back of all of these buttons, you can put a uh, hook and loop or Velcro and be able to mount these onto this board that's pictured here and um, set it up how you need without these uh, switches and buttons flying all over the place. It really locks them down. You also get label stickers, so you can label e each of these labels on these buttons here are actually stickers that you can customize. Um, so they have uh, three, you know, they have all of the different button inputs represented for each of these switch sizes as well. So you're not um, you're not stuck with just doing uh, the big buttons as the A button. You can really customize it how you want. Uh, and there's hook and loop stickers and ties that you can put onto the bottom of the buttons. And all of this comes for, again, only $100, which is really amazing. You're talking about a dozen different switches that could cost, you know, well over $1,000, and you're getting it for $100. This paired with the Xbox adapt Adaptive Controller is really amazing. Uh, there's also accessible controller modifications. Um, so there's a few different companies that have been um, providing controller modifications. Uh, some of the companies include Broadened Horizons, Evil Controllers, The Controller Project, Scuff Gaming. Um, and there are also many controller modification solutions that are available online that can be 3D printed at Thingiverse.com. So I have a couple of pictures over here of a couple of those different uh, solutions, the top one being a scuff gaming controller. Uh, it's just a skin that you put on top of the controller and it allows you to have um, kind of extended access to those buttons. The Cronus Max Plus is a really cool device. It's a little thumbstick. Um, um, it provides crossover gaming. So you plug this into pretty much any platform, whether it's an Xbox 360, an Xbox One, PlayStation, PlayStation 4, and it allows you to use any controller uh, with any of those platforms. So if you wanted to use a PlayStation 3 controller that you've already modified to be accessible for you, but now you want to play on an Xbox One, rather than having to get an Xbox One controller and adapting that and modifying it so that it was accessible for you, you'd be able to use your PlayStation controller on your Xbox One uh, using this device. Um, it also works for Android and Windows PCs. 
um, you can use a, a Wii controller on the Xbox One if you wanted to. Um, you can also use mouse and keyboard control on any of these platforms using the Cronus Max Plus. Um, so again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to controller modifications. If you have a controller that already works for you and you want to use it on a different platform, uh, you can use the Cronus Max Plus to do that. There's also the ability to program macros and scripts. So there are different games that require various button combinations. And myself, I have a hard time remembering them. Uh, I don't play a whole lot of fighting games, but a lot of times they require that you uh, perform multiple inputs in a row to perform a move. Um, I'm a button masher. I can't remember all of those different things. Um, so with a Cronus Max Plus, I'd be able to um, create a macro where it says when I hit this button, I want you to perform all of these button combinations at once. So I hit that button and it does them all at once and uh, it just makes it a lot easier to access. Uh, moving on to PC accessibility solutions. Dragon, naturally speaking, is really great for being able to access your PC. Uh, it's voice dictation software. Uh, you can create, edit, and format documents. It also allows voice control over your PC. Um, so you can say open applications. You can say open Microsoft Word, and it'll open Microsoft Word, and then you can just start dictating whatever you want into that document. You can also control your mouse using Dragon Naturally Speaking. So you can say move mouse upward, um, and then you can say faster, slower, stop, double click, right click, all of these different things that you could expect to do uh, with a physical mouse you can do using your voice. There's also vo mouse grid, which is uh, what I have pictured here on the right. Uh, so it, when you say open mouse grid, it uh, divides your screen into nine even uh, sections. Then you say which section you want, and it divides that uh, little section up into nine more sections. And you keep going until you have um, the mouse exactly in the section that you want, and then you can say click. So I've seen people that are so um, adept at using mouse grid that they simply say open mouse grid 771 click, and that brings up the start menu. Um, so it's really um, an easy way to be able to access your PC, to be able to access your internet browser, to be able to access Skype, all of these different programs that you would use on a PC to stay socially connected. Uh, 3D Rudder is a foot controller that sits on the floor. Um, it allows for joystick emulation, so you can plug this in to your computer. You can also plug this into an Xbox adaptive controller. Um, it allows you to uh, emulate a keyboard as well, so you can use your feet uh, to control uh, your keyboard. You can also control your mouse using your feet with this. Uh, and there's nothing saying you couldn't put this up in front of you up on a desk and use your arms with using uh, large mov movements as opposed to the micro movements that a keyboard or mouse would require. Um, you can control movement and video games using this. Uh, you can also browse the web and access your various Microsoft Windows programs. Um, Toby Eye Tracker is another great uh, solution for PC. Uh, so the Toby Eye Tracker 4C, it tracks the movement of your pu pupils. Um, it allow, uh, it's used for enhancing gameplay a lot, of, a lot of times. So rather than using your mouse to look around, you can actually use your eyes to look around. Uh, and it's really great for point and click uh, games as well as browser games. Uh, there's also a full version of Minecraft that's completely playable using eye tracking called iMine. And again, I know I'm running short on time here. I'm kind of blasting through these, um, but the presentation will be available to everyone after this is all done. Um, and uh, you'll be able to definitely look into these uh, sections uh, a lot more in depth. Uh, Open Sesame is a really amazing app. Uh, so it won Best Accessibility App at Google I.O. in 2018 and 2019. Uh, it allows you to control your phone using minor head movements. So it actually um, tracks your nose and uh, just from moving your head around just a very little bit like this, you're able to control a mouse on your um, a mouse cursor on your Android phone and uh, be able to tap, swipe, 
drag and drop all of the different uh, features that you'd want to do uh, on your phone, you can do just using very minor head movements. It's very easy to configure as soon as you open the app. Um, it, it looks for your nose and uh, just automatically calibrates. Um, it's available on Windows and Android. Unfortunately, it's not available on iOS. However, they do provide a talking keyboard on Apple iOS. And for at first, uh, they were offering a seven-day trial and a $19.99 a month subscription fee. But now it's absolutely free for everyone to use. And the website for that is sesame-enable.com. I really encourage people to check this out. It is absolutely amazing how well it works. Uh, the Tecla E is a wireless device that controls smartphones and tablets, uh, allows you to use external switches. It's very similar to the Xbox adaptive controller, but for your phone. It can interface wirelessly with a head array. So if people are using a wheelchair and they have an array of buttons around their head, um, they can access all of their functions on their phone using that same head array. Uh, and it's the only switch interface that works with both iOS and mobile uh, Android mobile devices. Android on the go adapter. This is another really cool, um, simple device. Android devices support mouse and keyboard as well as most other USB devices through one of these cables. Uh, it's a simple dongle that you plug into your phone and then plug your other devices into uh, this cable. Um, some other supported devices include printers, uh, controllers, so a video game controller, if you wanted to use that for your phone, you could. Uh, you can plug hard drives and thumbsticks into your phone, microphones and cameras, MIDI controllers if you're wanting to make music on your phone, um, all of these different things. Uh, most people don't realize that you can use a mouse and keyboard on your Android phone uh, just by plugging it in, uh, and it works just like any other device you would expect uh, with a mouse and keyboard. Uh, tabletop accessibility solutions. I wanted to mention real quick tabletop simulator. So uh, with social distancing, uh, I myself have a tabletop gaming group that used to meet every week. Um, but because of coronavirus, um, we've actually made the transition to hosting uh, virtual tabletop gaming um, meetings uh, using uh, Discord, which is a uh, voice uh, conferencing program that's free, uh, Zoom, or whatever other voice video chat program. Uh, Tabletop Simulator is a program that's available on Steam, uh, and uh, there are thousands of tabletop games that are available. It pretty much simulates uh, the experience of sitting around a table, um, passing out cards, really pretty much any board game or card game you could think of to play um, is available on Tabletop Simulator. Um, there's many games that include built-in automation, where as soon as you hit like a deal button, it deals out all of the appropriate cards to all of the different players. Or even like if you want to set up a Monopoly game, you hit uh, a setup button and it automatically sets up the whole uh, table. Uh, it really makes uh, tabletop gaming accessible for everyone. And this is available on Mac and Windows PC uh, through the Steam Marketplace. Um, if you Google Steam or Tabletop Simulator, you'll be able to find uh, you'll be able to find that for sure. Um, and then it's only uh, twenty dollars. So really, the ability to have access to all of those different games uh, is available for only twenty dollars. It's really amazing. Uh, some more tabletop solutions. Uh, Roll20 is a platform that's available online. Uh, it allows you to um, roll virtual dice. It also allows you to keep track of virtual character sheets. Uh, Roll20 is really, um, it's made with a tabletop pen and pencil or pen and paper uh, RPGs. So games like Dungeons and Dragons um, is what Roll20 is really made for, being able to keep track of your character sheets, being able to uh, enjoy that role-playing adventure with your friends online. Uh, digital assistants, the smart speakers that I talked about also have games that are built into them, as well as at any time you can say, uh, roll uh, a dice, uh, roll three dice, uh, roll a D10, 
uh, roll d20, um, any kind of dice or um, coin flips that you would want to do, you can accomplish using your uh, digital assistant. Um, some other resources, some helpful websites I wanted to mention real quick. DaggerSystem.com is a video game review site that spe specifically focuses on accessibility. They review the accessibility of mainstream games and let you know um, just how accessible any game is. Um, so if you're curious if you can play Spider-Man um, with your disability, um, you can check out DaggerSystem.com and they'll let you know exactly what the barriers are to playing that game, what accessibility features are included in the game and all of that. Ablegamers.org is a foundation that is um, built upon the idea of making sure everyone is available, uh, able to play, everyone is able to participate in the community of gaming. Uh, they're a really great resource um, for developers and gamers alike. And then Craig Hospital, um, they have a wonderful gaming program at Game uh, Craig Hospital. Uh, that um, I encourage everyone to check out. And again, these are all links uh, to those various websites in the presentation. And with that being said, um, we're wrapping up now. And if anyone has any questions at all, I'd be happy to take them. I know we ran through all of this super quick, um, but again, if anyone has any questions at all now, or if you have any questions that you think of in the future, um, I think the slide after this one, I have my contact information and you can always reach out to me at any time and I'll help out to the best of my ability. Thanks, Ben. That was a, that was a great presentation. It's, it's pretty crazy to see the variation that exists now within that gaming industry um, to help accommodate for people that have, uh, that have um, different uh, that require different accommodations and accessibility um, have different accessibility requirements. Uh, so, folks, we are going to transition into the Q and A portion um, of the of today's session. You should see the Q and A panel on the right side of your screen. If you do have a question for Ben, if you'll go ahead and type in your question there. Um, if you do require a video relay service, we have a staff member um, kind of standing by to field those questions. You can um, you can send those calls to four two three two nine eight two, four, eight, nine. So Ben, we do have a, a couple questions coming in here. Um, the first one, what are some upcoming accessible technologies that we should be looking at, looking out for? And I kind of want to break this one, one open a little bit. Um, so you've been speaking very specifically about different gaming um, consoles and solutions and that sort of thing. If we have a lot of our audience that maybe aren't into gaming, for instance, what are some <laughs> some ways going forward that the gaming industry can pioneer different technologies that would maybe transcend that industry and be able to influence people that might not be into gaming. So you can answer both, both in the world of gaming and then solutions that would extend beyond gaming. Sure. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, this is kind of what you're looking for. Um, one, of the, one of the solutions for um, technologies that can uh, surpass uh, gaming uh, the, the real-time chat transcription that I had mentioned, um, that's in-game for a couple of games on Xbox One right now. Uh, that same uh, feature is being added to Microsoft PowerPoint. It's actually available in Microsoft PowerPoint now, where if you don't have access to a live captionist, a professional captionist, you can still have your presentation captioned uh, so that everyone would be able to um, access that. Um, it's uh, real time uh, recognizing whatever you're saying and it pr provides the little caption box at the bottom of the presentation so that everyone would be able to access that. As far as technologies that are coming out um, that people should be looking out for, um, I know that Google is going to be releasing a new smart speaker very soon. One of the things that um, they've been working on is making it so that you don't have to have an internet connection in order to use a smart speaker. Right now, the way it works, it re it records your voice for a moment whenever you say the hot word. It uploads that recording to the cloud where um, it then uh, trans the AI models translate that and then send it as a command back to your speaker. Um, right now, those AI models are, um, they require a lot of storage and it's something that isn't, wouldn't be able to be fit onto a speaker device itself. It, it just requires 
much storage. Um, but they're working on reducing the size of those models so that they will be able to fit onto your device. It won't have to be um, internet connected. You don't have to worry about any privacy concerns or anything like that. Um, you don't have to worry about having access to internet, which is something that is a barricade to a lot of people. Um, and you'd be able to still control your smart devices throughout your home. Yeah, that's great, especially too when we're talking about going forward. Um, I know in Chattanooga, for instance, we had Deb Sosha earlier in a different session that uh, worked for the Enterprise Center. One of their initiatives is about digital equity. So that's what you're talking about is, is for a lot of these smart devices to be universally accessible, regardless of ability or access to internet, which is really great. And the question that we have was, is the table simulator accessible to screen readers? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I, I, I would have to look into that and get back to the person, unfortunately. Absolutely. And uh, for the person that asked that question too, we can, uh, I can touch base with Ben if you want to do a little research on that, find some, some answers maybe to that, and then we can connect the two of you after this session is over. Um, where are you located in Georgia and how far are you able to travel to provide your services to individuals? Yeah, um, so I'm actually in Alpharetta. It's about 20 minutes outside of Atlanta, um, or of Atlanta. Um, right now, I am focusing on the Atlanta metropolitan area as far as going out and actually installing um, devices. Um, however, I would be willing to work with organizations uh, to have me travel out of state and provide maybe my services for several people over the course of a couple of days of the week. Of course, right now, even with uh, the coronavirus pandemic, I, I'm unfortunately not traveling anywhere right now. Uh, we get this bug, uh, you know, figured out. Um, I'm happy to travel um, to various states and organizations. For That's great. For that. um, so some of the uh, website assessment tools in your last slide, um, do they also review any games for blind accessibility? Oh, absolutely. Yes, Dagger System, um, you, they cover the whole spectrum of disabilities, whether it's cognitive, physical, um, or, um, you know, uh, uh, vision, uh, hearing related, any kind of disability, they review all of that. That's great. Um, so I don't know how many people of our audience were present for your wife's presentation last week, but uh, she talked and gave us a little bit of an insight into her world. And she is someone who's very reliant on assistive technology on a day-to-day -day basis. How has, you know, with her being your partner, how has your observation or, you know, kind of the, your intimate connection with having someone in your household that relies so heavily on assistive technology, how has that changed your approach to your work? Well, I mean, of, of course, previously, prior to ever meeting Liz, you know, I was working with various technologies, but never thinking about accessibility or disability or how it can really change people's lives. And it's really been, it's been eye-opening really. Um, you know, just, uh, we started out with just a couple of smart lights and a couple of, uh, you know, a smart speaker in our house. And for Liz to be able to just go to the closet and say, turn on the closet, and be able to pick out her outfit that day. It's just really eye-opening, like just how how much of a game changer this technology is for people with disabilities. I've just been really impressed with it. And I know a lot of people, when they see these commercials, when what, uh, they see that it's making life more convenient for people that are already able to do these um, tasks around the house. But they don't really touch upon how it can really change people's lives when it comes to uh, accessibility and living independently. And I just uh, I try my best to make sure that people understand that, that part of it.